this is an absolutely uh, unique experience for me, and I'm sure for all of us, to actually be in the city of Jerusalem on Passover, an experience that, frankly, I never thought that I would uh, have in my lifetime, and to be here to uh, celebrate this incredible feast is something that really is beyond comprehension. Now, we're going to celebrate it through Scripture while our Jewish brethren and friends are literally celebrating, and we will talk about that. It's very interesting in the background, of course, the uh, old city of Jerusalem, and we happen to be uh, uh, looking over into the area that is really the Jewish and the Armenian quarter, so we're really pointing in the right direction for this study. And to me, it is uh, just awesome to think that the celebration that we're going to be studying at this time has been going on now for several thousands of years. And right now, all over the city of Jerusalem, tens of thousands of Jews are celebrating Passover. All over Israel, thousands more are celebrating Passover. Jews all over the world are celebrating Passover. And you and I are privileged to be here to spiritually celebrate what they are physically celebrating. So it is an incredible evening. It is just before sundown, and as you know, in Jewish reckoning, uh, we reckon a day from sunup to sundown. Theirs was from sundown to sundown. And the chiming of the hour in the background, it is nearing uh, sundown, and therefore... This is what we would call the eve of Passover, and they would call the eve of Passover. But tonight is the night that the Seder meal is eaten by Jews all over the world. And you and I are privileged to be here in the very place that the Lord Jesus ate his last Passover meal with his disciples. And uh, so let's uh, pray and ask that he would instruct us in this time together, this very unique moment, to be in Israel for Passover. Father, as we celebrate here tonight spiritually, as the evening hour approaches, as sundown comes when the Jewish people all over Israel, all over Jerusalem, all over the world are celebrating this very old Passover tradition, one that was instituted by you. Father, our prayer for them would be, as the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Paul said, that the veil would be lifted from their eyes. Because we know that he said until this very day as they read Torah, as they read the Tanakh, there is a veil over their eyes. And they have not yet, most of them, seen that you indeed are Messiah, Yeshua, the Anointed One. And so, Lord, because you are portrayed in every aspect of the Passover... The Passover pointed toward you, and you fulfilled it and consummated it 2,000 years ago in this very city. And so as we study this story, we would ask that the veil would be lifted from their eyes, and that literally this Passover, there would be many, many Jewish people who would see Yeshua, that they would see that you indeed are the long-awaited Messiah, and the soon returning king. And so, Father, teach us as we also turn to your word as they do to celebrate and study this common feast. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Jesus said on this eve to his disciples, I have desired to eat this Passover meal with you. As far as we know from Scripture, Jesus celebrated three Passovers in his public ministry. We saw when we were in Nazareth that uh, his parents were very, very devout Jews. And therefore, they took him up every year for Passover. And they fulfilled every letter of the law, and I believe the spirit of the law also. But when it comes to his public ministry, we only know of three Passovers, and this is primarily because of the Synoptic Gospels and John and putting them all together. Now, we will not read all of the accounts, but I think it will be helpful if we begin to look at at least a portion of it 
in Matthew's Gospel, remembering that Matthew's Gospel was written primarily for those who were Jewish readers. And as a result, our Jewish Christians are those who had a Jewish background, and therefore they understood Torah, they understood Tanakh, they understood the law, and many of them also understood uh, the, the Mishnah and um, uh, all of the other uh, traditions of, of Judaism that they were celebrating. And so let's uh, look at the 26th chapter of Matthew as we look at this uh, Seder, the Passover meal that the Lord Jesus had with his disciples. Beginning at verse 17. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now let me just pause right there because we're going to go through both the New Testament and the Old Testament passages together and try to give some explanation and interpretation as we go. It said, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now when we study the feast, you will understand that sometime Passover is spoken of by itself, and since Passover tonight, this eve, was a one-meal experience, it immediately led in to a seven-day feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And unless you carefully understand that, there will be some confusion, because sometimes uh, they are spoken of separately, Passover and Unleavened Bread. Sometimes Passover is inclusively used for both, at other times the Feast of Unleavened Bread is used for both. But here it is saying that on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day is Passover, and that's what we are celebrating. The disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Now we have been sensing, and we have heard from our beloved Jewish guide, uh, how all of Judaism, including his household, has had this sense of anticipation and expectation that's been building all week and especially all day today. This is the day of preparation for any final preparations that need to be made for the Seder meal, for the Passover meal that can begin any time after sundown. And after sundown, it is officially uh, the time of Passover, <clears throat> and therefore the Seder meal uh, uh, can be eaten any time from sundown through the late hours of the evening. And as we have heard oftentimes, the Hasidic Jews will continue the meal and celebrate and read Scripture and sing on into the night. So Jesus uh, was asked by his disciples, where do you want us to make preparation? You don't just go in and do it. It takes some preparation to get ready to have the Passover meal. And so they went to make preparation for the Passover meal. Verse 18, he replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him. Now what city is he talking about? He's talking about the city that is right behind us back here, the city of Jerusalem. Probably at this time they were at Bethpage, they were at Bethany, they were somewhere in the outside of the city. And so he told them, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Now, one of the important things that I think it is so crucial that we remember is the Passover was celebrated in the home. Now, one of the reasons that we are here, rather than somewhere with Jewish people, you don't go to a synagogue, and since the temple does not exist, you don't go to a temple, you celebrate Passover in the home. Now, here is one of the basic premises that I personally believe that we Christians have lost very tragically from Judaism, from our Jewish roots. We have largely made so much of our Christian experience a church, a building-centered situation. But for Judaism, it was centered in the home. 
Everything that took place outside of the home was just cream. It was gravy. The essence of Judaism is practiced in the home. Now, I believe that that's a principle that we need to go back and to relearn from our Jewish brethren. Because if that would happen, we would get rid of this mentality that we take our children, drop them off at Sunday school, and there is where they are supposed to get their Christian education. My friends, if you expect Sunday school, if you expect youth group, if you expect the average church to educate your child spiritually, you are going to be solely disappointed. God never intended that to happen. Whether it was the tabernacle, whether it was the temple, whether it was the synagogue, it was all, first of all, meant to be home-centered. And so when Jesus said, I desire to eat this Passover with you, go make preparations, he didn't say, go to the synagogue. He didn't go, say, go to the temple. Both were in existence. He said, go to a certain home. And I can't emphasize that enough because I think this is where uh, we have lost some of the richness, as Paul talked about in Revelation chapter 11, the richness of that we have uh, been engrafted in because we're the wild olive branch that has been engrafted into Judaism, but this is a part of the rich sap that unfortunately we have set aside. And so I can't uh, tell you how important I think that is that we go back and do that. Now let's just read one other parallel account before we go to the uh, uh, Old Testament and look at the background. Let's go to Dr. Luke's account. Very, very similar, and yet there are a couple of things here that uh, might amplify what we have already seen. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Now, we know it's also in Mark. It also begins. Now, uh, we know when it comes to John's gospel, he begins in John chapter 12, what we know it, and John chapter 13 with the bathing of the disciples' feet. And it's a much, much longer, John takes a completely different approach. But we want to uh, just emphasize the Passover part. So let's look again at Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 7. <clears throat> then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Now you note again how the two are uh, inseparably connected together the day of unleavened bread on which Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Now, once again, this is the night when that took place over 2,000 years ago. And it's just unbelievable that we have the privilege of being here and being a part of that celebration. Jesus sent Peter and John. Now, see, in Matthew, we didn't have that, did we? In Matthew, it just said he sent two of his disciples. That's why when you put... Uh, scripture with Scripture, you get a little bit more information because of their different purposes when they're writing. Now we know that the two, two disciples that he sent were the inner circle. He sent uh, Peter and John. Remember that Jesus had the twelve. Within the twelve, he had three, Peter, James, and John. And within the three, there was the one, John the Beloved, who was even closer to him. And so at this particular time, we find that uh, uh, Jesus sent Peter and John to prepare the Passover meal. And he said, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Now, that in itself is somewhat significant. Now, this certainly was not the size jar that he probably carried. This is a much, much bigger one. This is the size that they would pour in uh, smaller jars into. But one of the things that um, sort of strikes you about this, quite frankly, men didn't normally carry the water. That was a woman's job. And so, in all probability, that little phrase lets us know that this was a point of preparation on the part of the Lord Jesus. He had made preparation ahead of time, or in some way, that a man, which would have been easy to spot because a man is not normally out in that culture carrying the water. And so Jesus told the disciples, you'll see a man carrying a jar of water. 
follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house. Now, obviously, the man carrying the water was not the owner, but was a worker, a servant, or someone that the Lord had previously arranged this with. The teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. Now, this is where the upper room becomes very, very significant. There is an upper room in Jerusalem that uh, we visit each time we come here. Whether or not it is the upper room, it certainly has a lot of uh, historical tradition behind it that that perhaps was the place that is large enough for that to happen. But whether or not that was the uh, exact one, we don't know for sure. But the point is we do know that the Lord uh, met his disciples in an upper room. Now, also, as we will see when we come to the whole situation of Pentecost, we oftentimes think that Pentecost took place in the same upper room. I think we're going to see from our later study that that was probably not the case. Now, having looked at the portions that we are familiar with, and I'm not purposely going any further, I just wanted to go up to the preparation for Passover, uh, because then it goes into what we call communion. Now, from our standpoint as uh, Christians, we believe that that was the last official Passover. That when Jesus uh, served that Passover, he basically made a transition, a transformation, a completion, if you will, from what we call Passover into communion. Now, unfortunately, I believe that we have reduced communion to um, far less than God intended it to be, and we will look at more of that when we are in the garden tomb where we're going to be focusing specifically a little bit more on the second part of the uh, festival of Passover. But uh, in this session, since this is the time, even as we are studying, that Jews are making preparation, families are coming together, children are getting excited, Jewish mothers are getting tired... <laughs> because they have been cleaning all week. They have some specific things they have to do. They have been buying the right kinds of foods. They have been buying the right kinds of herbs. And so this is the night now that, uh, that this took place. Now go with me, after having looked at the background, go with me to uh, Exodus chapter 12. We looked at the last Passover uh, in... Matthew and in Luke, now we're going to look at the very first Passover that the Lord Jesus uh, re goes back to when he tells his disciples to go make preparation. So once again, now we are going to the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. Now, as you know, there are several other accounts. We won't take the time, but just for your parallel study, Passover is also taught about in Numbers 28 and in Deuteronomy chapter 16. But this is the first one that the others refer back to, that both the Numbers account and the Deuteronomy, all of this is Torah. Remember, Torah is the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So all of this was given uh, by God uh, uh, to Moses. Now remember that when it comes to Torah, when it comes to the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, we've got no difference with our Jewish friends. We believe that in absolute unity. Their scripture is the same as our scripture. Now then, let's begin and let's go through verse by verse Exodus chapter 12, a very, very familiar portion of scripture to us. Now remember again the immediate context. The immediate context was spiritual warfare. God has been trying to set his people free, not trying from the standpoint that he's having a struggle doing it. God doesn't struggle on anything. But in his frame, he is taking his people through this spiritual warfare. We're going to look in a few moments that there were ten plagues, not just sort of ten 
arbitrary things where God said, hmm, I'm going to zap them with flies. I'm going to zap them with locusts. I'm going to zap them, you know, that wasn't that. It was all very calculated, as we will see in a few moments. But we're now coming <clears throat> to the final tenth plague that was going to be the coup de grace. It was going to be the final act of uh, of severe grace, of severe mercy on God's part to liberate his people. Exodus 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt. Now, what did we see? Egypt is a typology of the world. Why? Because it was in Egypt that God's people were slaves. You're always a slave in Egypt. And in, we're always in bondage when we are living in Egypt. And we have seen that the whole exodus, that's what this story is about. That uh, Moses, who was the liberator, who was the progenitor typology-wise of the Lord Jesus, who set the people fully spiritually free, uh, he was the one who led the final exodus. And so exodus is about God's people being liberated from bondage in Egypt. Now, next verse, verse 2, very crucial. This month is to be for you the what? The first month, the first month of your year. Right in the margin of your Bible, New Year's Day. <laughs> now, we have New Year's on January the, 30, January the 1st. I happen, my birthday happens to be December the 31st, so I barely slid under the wire. But, you know, for us in the West, and one of the things I have seen as I have traveled around the world, New Year's comes at many, many different times in our calendar throughout the world. The Chinese have a New Year at one time. We have one at one time. The Indians have one. When I am in Nepal in a month or so, they will be having their New Year then. So it's important to understand that the whole world doesn't have the same New Year that we do. Now, what's most important? And quite frankly, <clears throat> the New Year that's most important is God's New Year. So... Isn't it significant that God said to the Jewish people, when you leave Egypt, that's when your new year starts? Now, that's a great principle. In other words, you know, we can't have a new year when we're living the old life. We can't have uh, a new year when we're in bondage in Egypt. And so God said, the moment I take you out of Egypt, mark it on your calendar in blood, that's when your new year, that's when your new life begins. Because when your new life begins, you have a new year. And so God here changed their calendar. Now, let's, uh, we will look at this more in uh, our next study when we look at all of the seven feasts of Judaism, but the three particularly where God said three times a year, every man, every male, as representative of the family must appear before me. So this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Now, this is, the first month in the Jewish calendar is the month of Abib, A-B-I-B, the month of Abib. But it was changed. It was changed now to Nisan, in, not, not the automobile. It's spelled practically the same way, N-I-S-A-N. So the 14th of Nisan is Passover. The 14th of Nisan is their New Year's Day. And so uh, Passover began one day, beginning at sundown, and the next day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread that we will see. Okay, so we can see then that all reckoning, all calendars, all timelines are changed at the new birth. You know, we oftentimes uh, talk about the fact, when was your birthday? Well, my birthday was uh, December the 31st, 1941. That was my physical birthday. But my spiritual birthday is another date. And each of us, you know, have a spiritual birthday. We may not be able to exactly remember the moment. How many of you remember the moment you were born physically? <laughs> None of us do. <laughs> But uh, the very fact that you are here verifies the fact that you were born. <laughs> and the very fact that there is spiritual life verifies that spiritual birth has occurred. 
And let me just pause. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but it is important because, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say, well, man, I can tell you that on July the 3rd at 6 o'clock or 6.42 in the morning or whatever, I was born again and my life. And then other people here, oh, boy, let's see, when was I? I can't even come up with a date. And then they begin to live in spiritual injury. Well, maybe I haven't been born again. But remember this principle, whether or not you can remember your birth date, physically or spiritual, is not the issue. Life is evidence of birth. Never forget that principle. If there is physical life, there has been physical birth. If there is spiritual life, there has been spiritual birth. But no spiritual life, then we have reason to doubt if there's spiritual birth. And that's another whole study altogether. When a child is born, it has appetites that need to be met and so forth. So it's uh, pretty easy to tell if there has been a spiritual birth. And so whether or not you remember your new year, your spiritual new year, the question is, is there a hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do I have a hunger for God's Word? Do I have a hunger to grow spiritually? Or am I in love with Egypt? If I am still in love with Egypt, then there's maybe question of whether or not there has been a new birth. Okay, so it's important then to realize that uh, the, the month of Abib, which was changed to Nisan, was the first uh, month of their first year of the rest of their lives. Now, it's also important to realize that this is the first month of spring. Winter has officially passed. Now, you wouldn't maybe know that right now because uh, <laughs> it's a little chilly out here in Jerusalem right now. Uh, earlier today when we were down toward the Dead Sea and the Negev, it was uh, pretty, pretty hot. But uh, today it is a little bit cooler. But the point is, spring has come and winter has passed. And that again is symbolic. You know, I, I love all of the seasons of the year. But, uh, and the Bible talks about different seasons of life. But the beautiful thing to realize uh, is, is what we see here, that uh, God began the new year in the spring, not in the winter. And so we move out of winter time, which is a time of barrenness. It's a time when things aren't growing. And then springtime comes, sap begins to flow, the flowers begin to bloom, the buds come out, the fruit comes, and that's representative of new life in Christ Jesus. So wonderful, wonderful symbolism here. Now, what were they to do? They were to take a lamb for each family, each household. Now, again, we see that uh, this is something that we cannot tamper with, that uh, Christianity, uh, our faith, uh, the Jewish faith, was based on the blood. Now, of course, uh, tragically today, since there is no temple, uh, the Jewish uh, people have no way of continuing uh, to have a blood sacrifice. And so they do it spiritually, and we believe that that was perfectly done by Christ. Now, once again, notice that take a lamb for his family for each household. Now, I am not trying to equate household salvation. It wasn't a lamb per person. It was a lamb per household. Now, again, we're going to see that uh, as we see in the book of Acts, household salvation did take place. A lot of times there were dramatic individual conversions like Saul on the Damascus Road, like Cornelius. But there were times, and Cornelius was one of those, the uh, uh, Philippian jailer where it said, and Acts 16 uh, says, uh, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your house. And so there is the household salvation concept in the Bible. Not that the patriarch can believe on behalf of everybody else. But when the patriarch gives the spiritual leadership, it certainly is going to give the inclination in that direction, whether or not the patriarch always lives to see it happen. As Joshua 24 says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's uh, what there should be. And so here we see the, the, the household represented. If any household, now this is, you know, again, the, the wonderful sensitivity of God's word. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, <clears throat> having taken into account 
the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. So we can see that God made wonderful provision, didn't he? Because in Israel, not everyone was married. There were singles. There were widows. There were widowers. There were orphans. There were aliens. And so God made provision for those to be adopted in so that no one would be left out, so that everybody would have a household. Now, again, one of the great birthrights of Judaism is it is a community, a family-oriented we come from the West where faith is highly, highly individualistic. It is me and myself and that's about it and maybe my spouse. But to the Jewish people and how much we have heard that, it was not only for your family but extended family. And oftentimes, therefore, a Seder, a Seder meal, a Passover meal in a Jewish home would not just have the immediate family, but there would be uncles and aunts and cousins and grandmother and grandpa and Aunt Sadie and all of the rest of them were there. So it is a very community-oriented thing. And we see that logically in the New Testament because koinonia togetherness in an extended thing was the characteristic uh, aspect also of the New Testament because those early Christians were all converted uh, Jews who were uh, be believed uh, all of the things of Judaism. Verse 5, the animal you choose must be what? It must be a year old male <coughs> without defect. Now, this is important for us to realize because obviously if there was defect that was allowed in the lamb, what would that make provision for? That there could have been defect, there could have been sin in the life of the Lord Jesus. And so the typology had to be perfect. All of the typologies in the Old Testament that pointed to Christ, there was perfection in them. And so the lamb could not have spot, blemish, or imperfection in it. If it did, then that would possibly mean that the Messiah could also be that. But the Bible said that he was sinless, faultless, blemishless. There were no faults in him. So it had to be one without defect. Now, what does that also tell us? That also reminds us that God deserves our best. Now, any cattle person, if you have got a lamb or a goat, and extend, extend the parable a little bit, or a cow or a bull or an ox, that is blemish-free, that is your prize, what are you going to want to do? <laughs> You're going to want to hang on to that thing. And you're going to want to use that for breeding and everything else. But God says no. Because your sin is great, you're not going to eradicate it cheaply. God was reminding us that our sin was grievous and it required the best that we had. And so it had to be without defect. Now notice carefully what comes next. The animal that you choose must be a year old without defect and you may take them from the sheep or from the goats. And so there was uh, flexibility here. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. Now, think back for a minute. It was, go back to verse 3. It was the 10th day of the month that each one was to take a lamb. 10th day to the 14th day five days. That meant for five days they were to examine the lamb. They were to check it, look at it. The priest had to examine it. Why? To make sure that they hadn't overlooked a disease, a defect, a flaw, a sickness, an imperfection. Now, I tell you, God's Word is just so incredible. After Jesus came in on Palm Sunday, which we have celebrated here also this week, what was taking place for the next five days? He was being examined by the priests. Is that not incredible? For five days, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious lawyers, and even Pilate, all of them, cross-examined him, asked him questions, tried to trip him up, tried to find a flaw. And without mistake, 
he stopped every mouth. And even Pilate said, I wash my hands. I find no fault in this man. Hallelujah. He was examined by man for five days. And that's why Jesus could say, which one of you can find a fault? Not a one of them did. So you see how precise God's Word is? You know, for, for five days they were to take this sheep or the goat and examine it. Just as Jesus was examined meticulously for those five days. Then we read, when twilight comes, you must slaughter them. Now, it is almost twilight as we are having this study. That's why I wanted to do it almost at the exact same, uh, same time. So at about twilight, they were to slaughter everybody simultaneously. Now, where were they doing it? In the synagogue, in the temple? No, everybody was doing it in their own house. Everybody and their extended household. So the whole community of Israel was doing it together. Verse 7, Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and on the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs. And that's exactly what millions of Jews will be doing in the next few hours. Their primary Passover meal, especially if they're kosher, if they're orthodox, they will be eating roasted lamb, certain bitter herbs, and the other things that are prescribed. And what is next and emphasized several times? and bread made without yeast. Say it again, yeast. How much today and yesterday and for the next several days, no more yeast rolls, no more good Jewish bagels, you're going to be eating matzah. And why? Because matzah is unleavened bread. And, you know, the matzah bread is so symbolic. Another whole study unto itself that we won't have time to totally get into. But no yeast could be allowed. Now, let me just throw in parenthetically, go back in the book of Leviticus and begin in chapter 1 and go through and see that no sacrifice by fire was ever permitted to have any yeast in it. And that's because yeast is always a typology of evil in the Bible. Always. Now, what, do, what happens, ladies, when you take a little bit of yeast and put it in a lump of dough that's sort of all flat, what happens? <laughs> it begins to puff up. But yeast, first of all, breaks down and then emits, you know, the gases and everything else, and then it puffs up. So yeast is a symbol of corruption and pride. And therefore, never ever was yeast allowed in any of the sacrifice. You ever notice how flat matzah is? As our guide said, it turns the sawdust in your stomach. I mean, it's sort of, yeah, you know, it's just sort of flat. You might as well eat cardboard or, or, or cardboard box. But the, what is the symbol of it? No yeast is in there. And what are the women doing for the three or four or five days before Passover? Spring cleaning. That's where it comes from. That's where we in the West get the understanding that we call spring cleaning. They clean their house from stem to stern, get rid of all bread, all yeast, because there can be nothing in there that would corrupt. Because God said there could be no unleavened bread. And Paul, if we had time, you just study it on your own. 1 Corinthians 5 said that we, uh, our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us eat the bread without yeast. So it's a wonderful, wonderful study in Scripture. We are called to be salt, but we are not called to be yeast. They work very similarly, but the end product is very different. And some of you have been through longer teachings that I have done on this. And so they are to eat bread without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. 
If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. Now, this is very crucial also. Now we have moved from what is to be prepared to how they are to begin to eat it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, with sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. What were they getting ready to do? The moment they had the meal, they were out of there. They were getting ready to exit out of Egypt. And so they were to eat it in preparation to move out. And again, that is great uh, uh, symbolism for us that uh, we are to not tarry in Egypt. We are not to linger and hang on or we will for 40 years be like the children of Israel and run round and round in the wilderness. And so they were to eat in readiness to depart and there was to be a sense of urgency about moving out of Egypt. And so it was sort of like, uh, I guess the closest thing that we could liken it to, is this, this would be a fast food restaurant. I mean, they're going to eat this baby and get on out of there because they were leaving. They were being set free. They were no longer going to be slaves. They were no longer going to be captives. Now, today, because people are not eating it to leave, they are eating it to remember and to commemorate. Now, it is a very long, unhurried, relaxed, commemorative kind of situation. But we today sort of do what well, our equivalent is, is communion. We do it, you know, we rush them up, rush them out, you know, mm, 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 and, and out we go. And, you know, communion is, is such a quick kind of thing rather than like the Seder meal. Verse 12, on that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn. Now this is, we said, this is the final, this is the tenth plague. I will strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, now, I can't emphasize how important this next phrase is also. And I will bring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. Circle that in your Bibles. What we're talking about is spiritual warfare. This was not just an issue between Moses and Pharaoh. This was a battle between Yahweh, between Jehovah, between El Shaddai and all of the false gods of Egypt. And so what God is doing here, <clears throat> He is setting His people free by showing the impotence, the weakness of all of the Egyptian gods. So let's look then and understand that there is a greater spiritual battle, spiritual warfare. Now Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, talked about this. He said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, they are divinely powerful to bring down the strongholds. And so, what we see happening here in the story of the Exodus is God challenging all of the strongholds of the enemy. Now turn with me quickly to, uh, to Numbers 33. Numbers chapter 33. And the reason I just want to give this parallel very quickly, and this could be a study unto itself, but Numbers chapter 33, um, beginning at uh, verse 3, uh, it talks about the Israelites set out from Ramses on the 15th day of the first month, the day after Passover, which was really the day of the uh, um, uh, unleavened bread, they marched out boldly in full view of all of the Egyptians who were burying all of their firstborn, whom the Lord had struck down among them, for the Lord had brought judgment on all of their gods. So it's again important that we understand that God was judging all of the false gods of Egypt. Now let me just, uh, without amplification, go quickly uh, through these. Uh, you can write them down or study them later. Now, the, uh, uh, the plague of blood, that was against Osisorus, that was the god of the Nile. Number two, the uh, plague of the frogs, uh, which was uh, against uh, uh, Heket, H-E-K-T, the goddess of the frog head in, in Egypt. 
the lice or the gnats was against Seb, S-E-B, which was the earth god of the Egyptians. The flies was against Scarabus, S-C-A-R-A-B-U-S, which was the dung beetle that I have in my office that I got in Egypt. That was one of the gods of uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, the cattle dying is uh, against uh, 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 Apis, A-P-I-S, which was the bull god. The boils were against Net, N-E-I-T, the god of health. The hail was against Shu, S-H-U, the god of the atmosphere. The locusts were against Serapia, S-E-R-A-P-I-A, the god of the locusts. The darkness was against one of their most supreme gods, Ra, who was the sun god of light. And then the final, the um, death of the firstborn was against Pharaoh, who was considered to be an incarnate deity. So, you know, if we had time to go into a much more detailed study of Egyptology, um, which is archaeology with an Egyptian focus, you can very clearly see that every one of these plagues was against one of the major gods of the country of Egypt. And so we find uh, God basically saying, okay, you worship that God? Let me show you how powerful he is. And just one after another, down the line, he nailed every one of them and showed their gods to be absolutely impotent. And then what did he say? I will bring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now again, if we had time to look at all of the parallels, let me just quickly machine gun a few principles uh, about the blood. Uh, Jesus talked in Matthew 26, uh, 28, where he spoke of the blood of the new covenant. Romans 3.25 speaks that we have atonement through his blood. Romans 5, uh, 8 and 9 say that we have been justified by his blood. Ephesians 1.7 says that we have redemption through his blood. Colossians 1.20 says that we have peace through his blood. Uh, Revelation 1.5 says that we are freed from our sins through his blood. And then Revelation 5, 9 um, says that with your blood you have purchased men for God from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. What are we saying? Without the blood there is no forgiveness of sin. And so God said to the uh, people beginning with uh, Moses, unless there is blood, there will be death, there will be judgment, and that will be the end. But where I see the blood, what does he say? The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. Thus the term Passover feast. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now let me just read through the rest very quickly. We won't take as much time because we will study that at a later time as we look at unleavened bread. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. How long? How long was it to take place? For generations. That's why Jews are doing it still, you know, 4,000 years later this very night because they're being obedient to this. You will celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh day must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one, of the, uh, and another one on the seventh day. Do no work on all of these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is, all you may do. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Now remember, Passover took place at night. The next morning, unleavened bread starts, and that's when they made their departure in the sight of all of the Egyptians, as we read in Numbers. So he brought them out. Celebrate the day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from, e from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. How long is that? Seven days. 
one week. So we have a one-day feast that's really a one-night feast that is followed by a seven-day feast. And you'll see that more in a later study. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses, and whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is an alien, a native, or a native-born. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summons all of the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once, select the animals for your families, and slaughter the Passover lamb. Now, if there was still a temple, that would be taking place right now. But because there is not one, uh, they do it spiritually and uh, physically in a different kind of way. And they do it through the commemoration of the Passover meal. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frames. Not one of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and on the sides and the door frames and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance. And we'll see how similar when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And it is for you and your descendants. Now, Note carefully as we close. Verse 25. When you enter the land, the Lord will give you as a promise, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask. See? Family orientation. And when your children ask, Mommy, Daddy, what does this ceremony mean? What is special about this night? Why does this night differ from all of the others? You tell them. It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. And so I think one of the things as we are here in Jerusalem on Passover, when Jews here and all over the world are celebrating this, we need to... I think, go back and reclaim some of our Jewish birthright. And as we will see a little bit later, and especially in the garden tomb, I constantly try to encourage Christian homes to take communion back into the home. Now, there's nothing wrong with serving communion, as we will see later, and going in the church. But Passover was a home-based family, parent-to-child teaching commemoration. And how much more it should be the very same thing. And that's why Jesus said, as oft as you eat this bread and drink this wine. Where? In a home. Not before an altar, a, gl a gilded altar in a church. That's okay. But that wasn't where it was meant to be. And as a family, some of the most special experiences we've had down through the years is uh, having communion around our table as a family, as an extended family. It keeps extending all the time, and we're delighted at that. And I hope I live long enough to keep doing it with my extended, extended family. So I just challenge you, let's uh, learn from Passover. Let's bring back the richness of the uh, spiritual sap that we have rooted in Passover. But let's move past that also to uh, gain the full benefits of the communion. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are just awed that you have seen fit in the fullness of your time to allow us to be in Jerusalem on the eve of Passover. And again, Lord, we thank you for the privilege, the incredible privilege of reading through both the Tanakh, the Torah, the Exodus account, and then the Gospel account and the fulfillment of the great Passover feast that became the great remembrance feast of our Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be like that lowly, unleavened bread that would be available to you so that you could use us for your highest purposes as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And for that, Lord, we will give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen.